Hello and a very warm welcome to the channel. I've got another History American reaction video for you guys today. So this is the American Revolution from the British perspective. It's from the Armchair Historian channel. I think this will be really interesting. I've talked about it before how I'm very much an America file. In, in fact, I believe I might have invented that term because <laughs> it is somewhat unusual in, in Europe. Um, but I, I, I think that the American Revolution, the, the, the good guys won, definitely. Um, the cause of human liberty was greatly expanded by the American victory and the British defeat. So I'm really interested in whether this video, which is, I believe is from an American, from, from the armchair historian, whether this video will change my mind, <laughs> whether seeing someone else look at it from the British perspective will, will convince me that actually I was wrong and that uh, hashtag King George III did nothing wrong. We'll see. I very much doubt that, but I think it'll be really interesting. Um, I always find it interesting to look at conflicts from the perspective you don't necessarily expect. So without any further ado, let's play the video. Although the history of the United States as an independent nation begins with the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, its roots reach back at least 20 more years with the start of the Seven Years' War. Okay. The fighting. And of course, George Washington served in the Seven Years' War with distinction um, as, a, as, a, as a British aligned officer. Between its two main participants, Great Britain and France, spread across the globe, reaching also their. So some, some people call the Seven Years' War the First World War, and I think there's actually a, a genuine case for that. I mean, it, 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 there was. The big conflict between Britain and France was fought everywhere in, in North America, um, in India, in, in the Caribbean. There, and simultaneously, there was a massive war in Europe in which the main competitor was Prussia. So it was generally a sort of British Prussian alliance, but they didn't really fight together that much. Their neighboring colonial possessions in North America. By the end of the war, France had been beaten leaving the British Empire in control over much of the eastern half of the continent. With its biggest competitor defeated, Britain now ruled the seas, as well as a third of all European trade. By all accounts, this was a major win for the burgeoning empire. Yet beneath the surface, the sails of victory were weighed down by the anchors of debt. Mm. Amounting to a total of 133 million pounds, the debt marked a significant hit to the British economy and pushed Parliament to take drastic financial measures. The Royal Navy, which had helped Britain to victory, was to become one of the primary losers in a series of cuts which would see its budget plummet from £7 million in 1762 to £2.8 million in the Ooh. aftermath of the war, yeah. and dropping to as little as £1.5 in 1769. These drop. measures, however, only accounted for a sliver of the debt, and British citizens would be forced to do most of the heavy lifting in the form of a series of new and higher taxes. However, the Empire would have little time to recuperate. Just as the embers of the Seven Years' War were dying out, a new wildfire erupted when a confederation of dissatisfied Native American nations in the Great Lakes region took up arms against the American colonists settling in their territory. In response, the British... So that, that's uh, Pontiac's Rebellion, I believe? ...government issued the Proclamation of 1763, which banned American colonists, with the exception of licensed fur traders, from settling west of the Alleghenies. Mm. Fearing a reaction from the disgruntled frontiersmen, Britain promptly reinforced its North American military presence, further increasing their debt at a rate of £320,000 a year. Thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Raid Shadow Legends. Okay, I'll mute it at this point. So that's a really interesting point. I mean, clearly, the I think the American Revolution was mainly um, fueled by feelings of obviously the excessive taxation and the feeling that Americans were being neglected by what, what I guess at the time was the motherland. Um, and I think I think that's absolutely true. But there is also the point that it seems that some of the American colonists really, really wanted to carry on pushing west. And it seems the British Empire was quite reluctant. Um, essentially, the, the British Empire wanted peace and quiet after the Seven Years' War. It didn't want lots of any, any new wars with, with Native Americans. And it, it, does, it does seem that that was also a contributing factor. So probably not the main factor, but, but definitely a factor. The link in the description, copy your in-game player ID, then head over to Raidyard. 
King George the Third. And of, of course, as always, um, link to the original video in the description. Please do support the original channel. Um, they do great work. They, they, they do most of the work. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Uh, also, I have a History Reacts channel. I will also link to that. British monarch now found himself in a critical juncture. His empire needed to find a way out of its increasing debt. But with his people already heavily taxed, and with the budget of critical institutions like the Royal Navy cut to the extreme, the only natural recourse seemed to put a shared burden on his American subjects. Besides, it was only fair that the Colonials pay for their way for the added protection they were receiving from the army. The colonists, however, had grown increasingly distant from their motherland, and the Americans would prove unwilling to meekly bow down before the demands of some faraway king. Mm, yeah. The first signs of dissent came when Britain introduced the Sugar Act in 1764, which taxed sugar, molasses, as well as other imported products purchased at a cheaper rate from sources outside of the empire. The act also forced captains of merchant ships to post bonds and provide exhaustive cargo invoices, while also allowing Royal Navy personnel to search and seize vessels suspected of smuggling goods. Soon, angry tradesmen were knocking on London's doors, arguing that the Sugar Act was infringing on their right to free trade, set out in a previous charter with the British government. Many colonists were unaware that the Sugar Act was just the beginning of taxation efforts in America. The Stamp Act was soon introduced, requiring citizens to pay taxes on a range of items by purchasing stamps. A similar version of this act was already providing close to half of the budget of the government from the pockets of English citizens, and would soon raise a large sum from its American subjects as well. However, these American subjects proved to be of a different mind as mass outrage erupted in... Of, of course, one of the big differences is whereas the, the British subjects had representation in Parliament, the American subjects did not. Um, so that, that, that's the, the whole no taxation without representation. Um, they, they were being taxed and because they had no representation, representation in Parliament, they had no way to, to influence proceedings. ...in the colonies, ultimately leading to the act being repealed in 1766. The British Parliament, worried about losing face and wanting to avoid being seen as losing authority over its American possessions, made sure to exchange the Stamp Act with the Declaratory Act, which stated that Parliament had full control over lawmaking in the American colonies. Soon, another tax on imported items such as tea and glass was introduced under the Townshend Act further incensing the colonists and leading Samuel Adams to write a letter on behalf of the Massachusetts legislature calling for a boycott of English products until the taxes were repealed. Mm. Like many others, Adams was outraged that the Parliament believed it had the right to force Americans to pay for the government's expenses without having American representatives yeah, in Parliament. That, that, that's the big Soon, the, big the slogan... No so I've always wondered what would have happened if the British government had said, OK, um, you still have to pay the taxes, but in return you can have parliamentary representation in, in London, in the Westminster Parliament. I wonder what would have happened. I don't know if it would have really worked because clearly at the time there were huge distances to be crossed. Um, so American representatives wouldn't really know what was happening when, when they were voting on it. But if, if that concession had been made by, by the British, I mean, I don't think it would have stopped America becoming independent. I think that was probably inevitable. But maybe it would have been more of a Canadian scenario where kind of the, the, the two gradually grift apart with, without violence and it, it's more voluntary. I don't know. Um, this is just my thoughts. Please do say what you think in the comments. I'd be really interested to read them. Taxation without representation would become the battle cry for colonists protesting British attempts to tax the colonies. Back in Windsor Castle, King George followed the developments from America with a remarkable sense of empathy for his dissatisfied subjects. While okay. discussing the Stamp Act, he stated that... This guy's a British propagandist. I'm not taking any more of this. He first deprived the Americans <laughs> by restraining their trade from the means of acquiring wealth and then taxed them. Britain's Prime Minister, however, Frederick North, or Lord North, saw things differently and remained a firm proponent of maintaining Parliament's right of authority over the colonies, which was seen as a vital component of British liberty. The matter of taxation was now increasingly becoming a matter of power and hierarchy, 
Similarly, American dissent was soon to transform into all-out rebellion. The city of Boston, home of public agitator Samuel Adams, was known as the beating heart of American unrest. Latent tensions against British rule would come to a head on March 5, 1770, when 400 Bostonians harassed and assaulted eight British soldiers, who, in the heat of the moment, resorted to firing their muskets into the crowd, injuring six and killing five. News about the Boston Massacre, as the colonists coined the incident, spread like wildfire, and only added to the unrest in the city. About four years later, the situation had escalated to the point that Parliament felt forced to enact the Coercive Acts, which included the reinforcement of the Boston Garrison by four additional regiments of regulars. Contrary to the belief that this added military presence would finally quell the riotous colonials, the sight of the hated redcoats in the streets, and the fact that the British soldiers were to be quartered and supplied by colonists only further angered the American public. So I, I believe, I might be wrong about it, I believe there's something about, um, is it something in the, De in the Declaration of Independence or in the Constitution about not quartering soldiers or civilians? Um, because I, I, I know at this time for kind of well-heeled folk, it was it was seen as, I mean, you didn't join the British Army in 1776 as a, a normal soldier rather than an officer, if you had many other choices, <laughs> let me put it that way. Um, so I, I think having British soldiers, I mean, people in London would have been equally outraged if they'd had British soldiers um, being, being, as in forcing, them, forcing themselves to lodge with them. So... I think that's an interesting point, what, what one, of the, one of the grievances. By February 2nd, 1775, the situation in Massachusetts had reached a boiling point, as Lord North officially declared the colony to be in a state of rebellion. Ooh. The commander-in-chief of British forces in America, General Thomas Gage, was promptly ordered to nip the rebellion in the bud by capturing its leaders. Gage first moved against a known rebel ammunition store in the town of Concord in order to deprive his enemy of gunpowder. However, on April 19th, Gage's advancing men walked into a gathering of colonial militia at Lexington Green. Tensions exploded when an unknown soldier from either side fired his musket, prompting the British to fire in force at the colonial militia. Word of the incident reached other militia groups in- I mean, it's like one of those questions, what would have happened if that shot wasn't fired? I mean, it, it seems to me likely that the tension was so high that something else would have caused um, an armed confrontation and therefore the, the American Revolution. But I, I, I don't know for certain. Maybe history would have taken a different course. In the area, and soon the British found themselves ambushed by armed colonials, ultimately resulting in a total of 20% casualties, Ooh. including several key leaders. Not wishing to lose more of his men in surprise attacks, Gage ordered a retreat. After reorganizing his men, Gage was ordered to hold on to Boston, which would allow the Royal Navy to land reinforcements. As colonial militias laid siege to the city, it was decided that British troops would make a stand at Dorchester Heights and Charlestown to the north of Boston, which included the high ground at Bunker and Breeds Hill. However, the British were up for a bloody surprise when they discovered that the Americans had already set up a series of formidable defenses on Breed's Hill. Uh. Casualties mounted as the infantry assaulted the position, and despite coming out on top when the musket fire finally fell silent, British losses had been such that the army would be put on the defensive for nearly a year. Yeah. I mean, the, f from a British perspective, Bunker Hill was a massive Pyrrhic victory. I mean, they won the the day in the sense that they they, they won the hill, um, but their sub their casualties were so much higher than the Americans. But as as the video just said, it is not worth stuffing out of them for for quite a long time. Even the previously empathetic King George had lost his patience, Ooh. lamenting Britain's relatively soft approach to the American colonies as having been a sign of weakness, he now urged the might of the British power to bear down on his rebellious subjects. On August 23rd, the proclamation of rebellion was officially released to the public. At home, American assets were frozen, while American ships were banned from entering British ports. Moreover, there was a significant division within the communities of the British colonies, 
many British loyalists who were sympathetic to the crown found themselves in precarious situations, facing hostility and often being ostracized by their American neighbors. Many of them had to flee their homes, relocating to Canada or returning to Britain. This internal and ironically, that is part of why Canada became quite so loyal to Britain is um, loyalists from the, the 13 colonies, especially towards the end of the war, fleeing northwards, um, but, but then keeping a very strong loyalist identity. Vision and the plight of the loyalists was a testament to the multifaceted nature of the conflict. In the meantime, 20,000 regulars were dispatched to America. Additionally, around 10,000 troops, often mistakenly called mercenaries, were sent from German states. Most notably, the Hessians. Contrary to common belief, these Hessians were not individual soldiers for hire, but were part of organized units leased by German princes to the British crown. Their presence was not a mere commercial transaction, but a complex web of political and diplomatic ties. The rebels, hearing of these reinforcements... So at the time, um, the British monarchy was heavily involved in Germany because the, the, the British king was also the elector of Hanover. So Hanover is, is a German state. Um, he was actually brought over to, from Hanover. I mean, I mean not George III, but his, his ancestors were brought over from Hanover to rule Britain, essentially because they were the closest um, descendants of, of, of the current royal family who were Protestant, that they didn't want a Catholic succeeding. So for, for quite a long time, Britain was heavily entangled in German affairs, as this video talks about. ...sent the Olive Branch petition to London in hopes of preventing a formal war from being declared. The petition restated the colonists' appreciation for the union of Britain and the colonies, and that they had merely taken up arms in response to the unfair measures taken against them. Mm. As such, the colonials were allegedly more than ready to restore peace if these issues were to be addressed. King George, however, decided to ignore the petition, and responded to America's declaration of independence by accusing the power-hungry leaders in the colonies of having openly rejected the British government. And so th th this is like another massive what-if moment. What if the British had responded more... I'm going to say it sensibly <laughs> to the Olive bar um, Branch petition. What, what happens if they'd actually made serious concessions, uh, if they recognised that elements of the, you know, the, the, the rebellion was, was done in a just cause and had made constitutional changes? Again, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe by this point the genie was out of the bottle, but perhaps th that you could have had a possibility that um, the, the American breakaway would have been longer and more peaceful. Again, kind of like Canada with the ongoing hostilities being the only right response. Reactions from the British media were mixed, with some newspapers praising the Americans' bravery, while others wrote mockingly about the Declaration's supposed pretentious prose. The fighting around Boston continued... So, I, I, I mean, this leads back to a, a lot of the arguments that defines English and then British politics in a kind of the century before the Revolution. Um, or even even more than a century about the the, the powers of the crown versus the power of Parliament. Um, to some extent, these were being replayed out in America. I mean, I, I've heard the argument that the American Civil War is almost a second version or a second English Civil War. Um, and whilst I think that's an exaggeration, definitely some of the same tensions between crown and Parliament and crown and representation are definitely playing out again, um, just on the other side of the Atlantic continued during the following months until General George Washington finally managed to capture Dorchester Heights on March 4th, 1776, forcing General William Howe, who had succeeded Gage as Commander-in-Chief, to evacuate the city. Having to come up with a new plan, the British command decided to focus its efforts on New York. In late June, after landing his army at Sandy Hook, New Jersey, Howe called a march toward New York City, where they were met by Washington's men. During Why is he lying fighting, down? which took place in the present-day northwestern Brooklyn Heights in heavy rain and fog, Howe nearly managed to encircle the Colonials, but rough winds on the East River prevented him from closing the gap. Close to 10,000 men managed to escape as dense fog masked ah. their retreat. Despite having failed to crush the Colonial Army, the victorious British now felt confident that their military superiority over Washington's makeshift army would ultimately and inevitably win them the war. 
how, in fact, was so encouraged by his victory that he initially attempted to get the Americans to restore peace by retracting the Declaration of Independence. When this proposal predictably went nowhere, <laughs> the general moved to secure New York City. And it sounds like the British were incredibly cocky. Um, I, I mean, in the early stages of the war, they, they kind of saw like a, a rag bag militia and a, a few sort of semi-drilled troops in, in the Continental Army, but, but, but nothing like on a European scale. Um, and therefore, rather than make concessions and perhaps um, tr try and sort of head off the whole thing, they were just convinced they could have an absolute victory. Incorrectly, the remaining of course. colonial troops. By the end of the year, Britain seemed to be poised to win the war. Their main stumbling block, however, would come from their arch nemesis, the French. Ooh. As the British army failed to Getting deliver serious. an anticipated knockout blow throughout the winter and into the following year, France decided to support the rebellion. Back in Britain, King George worried that the French were planning to make a move against the West Indies, which were a key part of British global trade. In response, 5,000 troops stationed in Philadelphia were withdrawn to reinforce the islands in 1778, marking the start of a major... And the, the Caribbean sugar islands were incredibly lucrative for the, the European empires around them, so particularly, obviously, Britain and France. Um, run by slavery, of course, um, very tragically, but their value was massive. I mean, a, a, a country would give up vast swathes of kind of empty territory in the American interior for a very small Caribbean island because they were making so much money from them. ...diversion of resources away from the American mainland to the Caribbean, eventually leading to British commanders begging for more soldiers and even prisoners being sent to make up for the lack of manpower. Meanwhile, the escalating war was starting to wear down on the patience of British citizens, who had to deal with ever higher taxes, while neighboring Ireland, in the meantime, suffered in the face of a major recession due to the halt on American trade. Yet despite these setbacks at home, British forces continued to gain important victories on the battlefield. In spring of 1780, General Sir Henry Clinton attacked Charleston, South Carolina. The Northern Theater had stalemated, and it was hoped that a campaign in the Southern... Jumping back quickly, actually, I was thinking, um, I think one of the factors that was quite significant in, in the American Revolution is they actually had quite a lot of least sympathy or, or understanding in Britain, including in the British Parliament. I mean, obviously, it was a minority view, but... There were some quite major figures, so, so I mean, Edmund Burke, for example, who is sometimes seen as kind of the father of modern conservatism, um, a, a huge critic of the French Revolution, I believe was pretty sympathetic towards the American Revolution, and, and he was far from being alone. Um, so kind of British public opinion was, that, that, whilst most of British people wanted to win the war, there was also a, a substantial minority who sympathised or at least understood the American position. Um, and I think that probably helped to kind of undermine Britain on the home front. Also, the point about France coming in, I mean, it, it wasn't just France, it was also Spain and I believe the Netherlands. Um, so essentially, Britain was now engulfed in a major European war, including a potential threat to, to Britain itself. Um, so I think the, long, the, the, the biggest battle of the American Revolution, I believe, was the Siege of Gibraltar, which, of course, happened <laughs> in Gibraltar rather than America. Um, so, yeah, you, 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 seeing, seeing what, what was a localised American conflict become potentially uh, almost a, a world war colonies, where British loyalists were more common, would finally bring the Americans to their knees. Amidst the war in America, the British were also fiercely defending the Rock of Gibraltar yes. in Europe. Commencing in 1779, this great siege of Gibraltar, a grueling conflict against Spain and France, lasted for nearly four years, and was the largest battle of the entire war, that, despite what? no actual Americans swear this guy's plagiarizing me. Americans being present. <laughs> While outnumbered and facing naval blockades, the British showcased their military prowess, employing innovative tactics and engineering feats, like the construction of the Gibraltar galleries, or tunnels. So it... Gibraltar is like a little bit, um, it, it's a rock on the very, very southern end of the Iberian Peninsula. It, it's still to, to this day contested between Britain and Spain. It's controlled by Britain. Uh, I have visited it. it. It's a really interesting place. And I did see some of the caves that were built during the American um, War of Independence when it was being besieged by the Spanish. And they, they were then reused in, in later conflicts as well. So, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting place. And also, they, they have these, like, rock apes, which are really, really aggressive and really, really friendly. 
Uh, and one of them tried to steal my dad's camera. So yeah, I've got, I've got mixed memories from Gibraltar. <laughs> Their tenacious defense eventually led to victory in 1783, solidifying British control over the strategic peninsula. Back in the colonies, British military prowess was also present. Charleston fell to the British after a six-week siege, capturing an entire colonial army of about 5,000 men. Emboldened, Clinton visualized a sweeping pincer strategy against the Americans. He designated the Southern operations to General Charles Cornwallis and moved north to marshal the troops. Yeah, jumping back again quickly, I, I'm sorry to keep doing this, I keep having thoughts. Um, one of the key reasons that the European powers felt comfortable entering the war, so the French particularly, is that the Americans had proven their worth, essentially. So the, 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 the first and second battles of Saratoga, the, the American victory at Saratoga proved to the French that the Americans were actually a competent ally, um, and they were a force to be reckoned with, and therefore worth supporting. Whereas before, they'd, I think they'd been a little bit suspicious of like ex exactly how serious is this rebellion? Is it going to be put down very quickly? You know, we, we don't want to get involved if it gets crushed immediately, and then the, the entire weight of the British Empire um, is directed towards France. So it, it was kind of the, the Americans showing their strength and their um, courage enough that the, the French thought these guys are worth backing. Around New York. The objective was a coordinated advance, with Cornwallis pushing the Americans through the Carolinas and Virginia, and Clinton's army converging from New York. By February of 1781, <laughs> Cornwallis was marching his men through North Carolina. He hoped to force General Nathaniel Greene's weaker American army to face him in battle. However, time for Cornwallis was running out as supplies were wearing thin, and his men began suffering from exhaustion. On March 14th, Greene's men were finally located at Guilford Courthouse. Once again, British superiority on the battlefield showed, but their victory was bought at a considerable cost, with 25% of Cornwallis's men having become casualties during the fighting. Ooh. Greene, in the meantime, had managed to escape the field of battle with the rest of his army. Having run out of patience, Cornwallis made the decision to bypass the Carolinas and move straight toward Virginia. After reorganizing his men, the British ordered a march toward the inland part of Yorktown. Here, however, the situation would take a turn for the worse. In September, a French fleet managed to penetrate British defenses and block access to the Chesapeake during the battle. I, I shouldn't make this reference, but I, I do quite like how um, they missed off the fleur de lis from the French flag and therefore just have a white flag, which I know is a certain very inaccurate stereotype about um, about French military prowess. Battle of the Capes. Cornwallis's men were now cut off from reinforcements and resupply and would be forced to dig in and await relief. By September 28th, an American army yeah, that one's got the fleur de French on it. troops began to lay siege to Yorktown. Perhaps the French Navy just didn't use the fleur de lis. I, I, I assume he's done um, more research than I have, so I, I guess they just didn't use it on their ships. Up in New York, General Clinton, heading the northern pincer, remained relatively calm. Writing about the situation, he stated that Cornwallis is safe enough unless a superior fleet shows itself, in which case I despair of ever seeing peace restored to this miserable country. His main concern was with Washington's army, whom he believed were preparing to advance on New York with the help of French ships at Staten Island. Further rumors about the French ships sailing up from the West Indies did little to soothe his concerns, and persuaded him to remain cautious rather this, than this hasten like his force to the aid of Cornwallis. Right. Washington, however, had no intention of attacking New York, and was, in fact, moving his men southward toward the trapped British army. Mm. The situation in Yorktown, in the meantime, was deteriorating by the day. Cornwallis had already abandoned his outer lines, but without supplies, his men could only hold on for so long. On October 19th, the defense fell apart as the 8,000 remaining British soldiers laid down their arms. Although the disastrous defeat at Yorktown was an enormous blow to the British army, King George urged his commanders to carry on the fight as if nothing had changed. In reality, it was clear that the Empire could not hope to reasonably sustain the costs in manpower, supplies, and funds that were required to prolong its efforts and to vanquish the rebellion. Moreover, the important American victory at Yorktown had likely only emboldened the colonial spirits. 
Ray. In Parliament, the writing seemed to be on the wall. America was here to stay, and the sheer effort it would require to attempt to put the proverbial eagle back into its cage was simply deemed not worth the cost. So th this is where the point of um, a divided British home front becomes really important. The, the, the fact that there was quite a few people in Britain who understood the American perspective, perhaps sympathised with it a little bit, um, meant that there, were, there was always people within Britain who wanted peace, who, who didn't really think we should be fighting that hard against the Americans when they thought the Americans had a point. A few more skirmishes unfolded before the peace negotiations began. The Treaty of Paris, finalised in 1783, brought an official end to the American War for Independence. In this pivotal agreement, Britain made numerous significant concessions. They recognized the United States as a sovereign nation and ceded vast territories east of the Mississippi River to the New Republic. The Americans were also granted important fishing rights off the coast of Newfoundland. The treaty defined the boundaries between British North America, now Canada, and the United States, setting the Great Lakes region as the northern border of the U.S. Additionally, Britain returned Florida to Spain, having previously captured it, and the Mediterranean island of Menorca, which the British had held, was ceded back to Spain. On November 25th, the last of the British troops departed from New York. While the treaty marked the end of the Revolutionary War, the sting of losing the American colonies lingered with King George III and the British establishment. And, and he then went mad. It would necessitate several tumultuous decades, punctuated by conflicts like the War of 1812, before the two nations established the deep-rooted alliance they share today. Hmm. Although, to, to be honest, I'd say the, the kind of current um, UK-US alliance has only really been a thing seriously since the, the end of the Second World War, when Britain decolonised, I think if Britain had tried to maintain its, its global empire post the Second World War, and I'm very glad it didn't, because I don't think it would have it would, it would have succeeded and it wouldn't have been moral. If it had, I don't think America, I think America and Britain would have still been rivals. But that, that was really interesting. Uh, it wasn't quite what I was expecting. I was expecting more like an argument sort of from the American Revolution from the British perspective. Um, but I, I mean, I mean clearly there, there was elements of that and it, it was also a good historical overview. You'll be pleased to know, haven't changed my view. Based on that, I still think that um, the American cause was, was the just one and that American independence was a huge boost for, for human liberty, say not just in America, but in, in time across the world. Um, obviously with, with caveats, um, unfortunately, around things like slavery. So I so say that, that was, I really enjoyed that. If you haven't already, please do subscribe and I hope to see you for the next one. Goodbye.